Good afternoon. Welcome to a panel discussion with Filipino and Filipino American women writers hosted by the Embassy of the Philippines in Washington, DC in honor of International Women's Day. My name is Eileen Casanero. I'm the Poet Laureate of San Mateo County in California and your moderator this afternoon. And here to give the opening remarks, it is my honor and great pleasure to introduce the Embassy's Deputy Chief of Mission, Mr. Renato Villa. Good afternoon, sir. Uh, thank you, Eileen. Good afternoon to our panelists and guests here in Zoom, and also to those who are joining us live on Facebook. First, let me greet all of you a happy International Women's Day. We are very happy to have you with us on this special day as we honor and celebrate women's roles and achievements in our societies. This powerful celebration allows us to renew our commitment to raising awareness against gender bias and helping for forge a gender equal world. I wish to thank our panelists, Cecilia Manguera, Brainard, Migs, Bravo, Dot, Luisa Igloria, Gales Roma Santa, and our moderator, Eileen Casineto, for sharing their time with us and being icons of women empowerment within the Filipino diaspora here in the United States. It is the first time that the Philippine Embassy is putting the spotlight on women writers and today's event proves to be more exciting as we will hear and learn from the stories of the storytellers. We have been more familiar with foreign authors, foreign books, writings and literature for far too long, especially in a foreign country where knowledge and access about the works of Filipino authors are neither popular nor accessible. Fortunately, we have been seeing an increasing number of Filipinos making a name for themselves in the global publishing scene and making their mark on the printed page around the world. Modern technology and tools such as Kindle, Audible, eBooks, Audible, e and many more likewise played contributing roles in making our writers the end voice of Filipino talent and creativity to readers across the globe. As we celebrate International Women's Day, we recognize the Filipino and Philam women writers that helped shape the Filipino American identity through their personal journeys and stories. I am looking forward to knowing more about their experiences as Filipino immigrants in the United States how they navigated various social issues that the Filipino diaspora has faced over the years and how they have worked for better representation and recognition in their chosen careers. It will also be interesting to hear how they brought their Filipino roots and their Philippine influences into the writings and published works. These stories and experiences are unique and hopefully can bring inspiration and a sense of pride to our audience and viewers. This afternoon's exchange may also provide the needed motivation and advice to young, to young and aspiring writers who are joining us. Even all this like myself, who in retirement may try my hand in writing. Many children in Filipino homes in past generations have been raised mainly by their mother and the mother to entertain them or lull them to sleep recites stories, fables, myths and legends orally or read to them from, from a book. My own mother read to us the stories from the weekly issue of the Liwayway magazine. But one story she told, told us are stories from her native Quezon province. Uh, it was about a Katipunero during the Philippine Revolution who was being pursued by the Guardia Civil and who went inside a cave at the foot of Mount Panahaw to hide. He went into a deep sleep, went out of the cave and wandered, not in his own time, the 1890s, but he found himself in the 1930s. He can't go home again, and there was to be no goodbyes to those he left behind. 
The story stayed with me, and until now, I remain fascinated by tales of time travel, such as H.G. Wells' Wells's The Time Machine or Stephen King's November 22, 1963, where a science high school teacher went back in time to try to stop the assassination of President Kennedy. This March, the Philippines likewise celebrates celebrates National Women's Month, which serves as a venue to highlight women's achievements and discuss continuing and emerging gender equality issues, challenges, and commitments. Allow me now to also give a quick shout out to the men behind the women, to the men advocates who take action against gender biases and stereotypes in their organizations, communities, and countries or simply those of you who are here listening and learning with us. We also celebrate you today. Incidentally, the Philippines will also be commemorating National Literature Month in April. And I remember a few years ago when the embassy displayed excerpts of literary pieces in the chancery, including that of National Artist for Literature, Edith Tiempo's Between Living. Please indulge me for a moment as I would like to read you the last two stanzas of the poem. So it's the space between the wishing and the end that is the true unknown, the massive world's timekeeping in our own agile flow, never to blend. And thus we care and thus we live, not for the end, since that is not unknown, it is the weight creative, life and love in full, unfinished, uncertain, unknown, yet mocking the known, not the known end that comes sooner, later, or not at all. It feels that this is an apt message for our time. Again, thank you to our panelists and guests, and may we have a fruitful and engaging discussion. Maraming salamat po at mabuhay. Thank you so much for your very inspiring words, Deputy Chief Mission Renato Villa. Friends, we celebrate Filipino womanhood not just today, but every day. In particular, we are celebrating the accomplishments of our panelists who have made strides in the world, in the world of contemporary literature. Our discussion will focus on the Filipino writers' role in the diaspora as they write from cultural memory, build new communities and shape conversations around society and literature. We are honored to have with us some of today's leading writers. Without further ado, I'd like to introduce our first panelist, Cecilia Mangera Brainard. Cecilia was born after World War II to a political family in Cebu. She is the author, most recently, of selected short stories from USD Publishing House. She earned her BA in Communications Arts from Marinal College and migrated to the US to do graduate work in filmmaking at UCLA. Cecilia is also the founder of Philippine American Literary House, a small press that publishes high quality fiction and creative nonfiction books by Filipino Americans and other Filipinos. Welcome Cecilia Mangera Brainard. Thank you, Eileen, and thank you very much to the people at the Philippine Embassy for hosting this program. Um, it's really an honor to be part of these very um, powerful women. These are, these are very powerful women warriors we have here. Um, I am going to share with you, I'm, I'm a fiction writer and usually my pieces are very long, but I found a flash fiction piece that's very short from my selected short stories. Um, and I think I chose it because I'm homesick. I, I visit the Philippines twice a year and because of the pandemic, I have not been there for over a year. And so this one is entitled The Che Guevara Night. And to those who are interested in writing, you may note that this is actually just one sentence long just one sentence long. It was 
was the night I call the Che Guevara night. My last night in Manila. So a couple of girlfriends and I went out to Malate, now a hot spot in Manila, to the Cafe Havana de Manila to be exact. Friday night it was when streets were blocked off and the rotonda teemed with people, not just the baklas of long ago, although I understand Remedio Street still has gay bars. I am always amazed at how crowded places can get in Manila. Malls, streets, packed with people night and day. And so at 8.30, we were seated in a corner of the cafe, the Remedio side, looking out at the very same street my mother and I used to walk on every Sunday on our way to Malate Church. And oh, the bitter, bitter sweet memories of that time of my life when I was 16 and living in Malate with my mother. But that night, the three of us sat in that cafe, which is not really a cafe, but a high priced restaurant packed with Che memorabilia, framed pictures of the charming, delicious Che, smiling, smoking a cigar and staring down at us. And waiters and waitresses looking cool with their red Che berets as we had our paella and lengua and two pitchers of margarita. And because I'd be leaving the next day, we didn't have enough time to tell the stories by women past their prime, two still looking for Mr. Right and talking about the Mr. Wrongs of their lives, now told with humor. Although 15 years ago, the same stories were told with tears. Three women huddled together, laughing with Che, listening to every word and smiling smiling, smiling. So this is my excerpt, uh, very short, and I hope you enjoy it. The Che Guevara Night from my selected short stories. Beautiful. Cecilia, you produced an impressive body of work that speaks not just of the Filipino woman's experience in the diaspora as she raises a family and creates community, but also the richness and diversity of Filipino history. How does it affect work set in the Philippines to write from here? So that, <laughs> so Eileen, I have to thank Lara Stapleton, I guess the author Lara for this question. Thank you, Lara. It made me crazy thinking about this because there's so many answers to it. So I'm, I'm gonna address it in, in, in pieces. Um, the, probably the correct answer is to say that my being in California should not have affected my work that's set in the Philippines. Um, because as a fiction writer, I focus on character and character development. And so I should be able to write about characters from anywhere in the world if I am following their story. So that's the ideal answer. But the reality of it is that actually, if I were working in the Philippines, I think I would be stuck as some of my friends have been because you always come up with people who say, oh, you're writing about your mother. Oh, you're writing about your boyfriend, you know? And in fact, by the time it gets down on paper, it's, it's not, no longer really my mother, it's no longer really that boyfriend. It's already become fictionalized. But I have friend, writer friends or want to be writer friends in the Philippines who get bogged down with this kind of external pressure on them. Now writing from California, I am actually free. I'm free from that kind of, of external pressure about how I should write. Oh, here's another thing. This writer from the Philippines also felt compelled to include in her writing words like tinapa and uh, you know Tagalog words. And I talked to her about that once and I said, why don't you just use salted fish? Then it's solved. So, but, but working in California, I don't have to struggle too much because when I'm workshopping it, my, the participants are gonna be bogged down with tinapa. So why persecute them? Just use salted fish. So in, in a way it does affect, but if you're really following character and character development, it should not matter 
Further, I mean, I could write about science fiction, for instance, and, and that could also work if the, now here's the thing, the geography and the culture have to be uh, credible. And so since I go visit the Philippines twice a year, I know the culture and I know uh, the geography. And if I were going to write about some other place, I can do research and I need to do that because my characters have to move around that world and it must be credible. But what carries the weight of the story would be the characters and what happens to them. I don't know if that answers Lara. It does. Thank you, Cecilia. I'm Thank sure, you. Thank you so much. I'm sure you all would like to know more about Cecilia's um, journey as a writer. We'll come back to Cecilia in a bit, but for now, let's meet our next panelist. Our next reader is Migs Bravo Dutt, author of the contemporary novel, The Rosales House. Migs is a writer and researcher whose work has been published most recently by Penguin Random House, Southeast Asia, and also forthcoming in the Washington Post. Please welcome Migs Bravo Dutt. Thank you so much, Sailin. Thank you so much for all that you do for the writing community. And thanks to the Philippine Embassy here in the USA um, for having me here. Thanks, DCM Renata Villa, um, Consul Darrell, and Leah. I really appreciate uh, your having me. So it's a great pleasure. I'm going to read um, a short excerpt from my novel, um, The Rosales House, um, which actually tells the story of Claire Rosales. She's a young, um, young professional in the diaspora who is in search of the truth about her identity. So the scene that I'm about to read is when she meets her biological mother, Melanie, for the first time. So here goes. Claire tried to imagine herself in Melanie's shoes, but however hard she tried, she couldn't see herself forsaking her own child out of filial duty. Out of curiosity, how did you manage to hide your pregnancy from other people, especially during the last trimester, Claire asked. My close friends were as naive as I was. They didn't notice the changes in my body at the time. I wasn't showing until the six month. And when I started to show, I told my friends it was a side effect of a steroidal medicine I had been taking. Then I simply hid from everyone during my last trimester. It was more manageable then. Remember, this was before internet and mobile phones, Melanie said. But what about your parents? Claire asked. I told them I was doing an internship at a provincial hospital, so I couldn't spend the school break back home. My parents didn't ask too many questions. It was easier to lie to them than to my friends. Melanie said the last sentence in a much sadder tone. How did you give birth? I'm sorry to ask you all these questions, but nobody bothered to give me the details of how I came into this world, said Claire, reminding herself to pretend she was interviewing a random person on the street, not someone who had carried her in her womb for nine months. Your grandfather took me to Laguna. She rented a room near San Pedro and she paid the landlord's wife to look after me. She knew a doctor who owned a small hospital nearby. Your adoptive parents were called over immediately after I had given birth. It was Dina's kindness that made me agree to the adoption, Melanie said. In all this, that's one thing I'm truly grateful for. Having daddy for a father, Claire said. Someone from City Hall came immediately and asked Dina and Anna to sign the papers and subsequently filed her birth certificate. So technically, you are not legally adopted. As from birth, Dino and Anna were registered as your parents, said Melanie, her voice quivering. 
That's why it never occurred to me that I was adopted. My birth certificate has them as my parents. I've always thought of them as my parents and perhaps it was indeed for the best. Claire tried to keep a lid on her thoughts but couldn't hold this one. Your grandmother promised to help me finish college but only if I signed a document relinquishing any claim on you and not to be anywhere near you. It read like a permanent restraining order, actually. She asked me to sign it while I was still dazed from the anesthesia. Claire wanted to ask if Melanie had ever held her in her arms or look at her before she handed her to Dino and Anna. She wanted to ask if Melanie had even checked whether she had 10 fingers and 10 toes. She wanted to know whether baby Claire had cried loudly or had merely whimpered. But all that was immaterial now. It wouldn't change the past. Claire bit her lip as she waited for Melanie to continue. I did my graduate studies and applied for a research grant that brought me here. Then I found a job that kept me here. Melanie was now looking great. She ordered a second cup of coffee and suggested that they meet again the next day. Claire saw Melanie off to the hotel exit by the Madison Avenue side. They hugged each other under the hotel signage, but Claire was conscious had to keep it too tight or too long, such that to a casual observer, it would look as though they were mere acquaintances who had bumped into each other, a scene that was not unusual in this puzzling scene. Thank you. We have a couple of uh, related questions from the audience. The first is, what was your publishing journey like from Mary Z? And from Yana Gilbuena, how did you overcome the gatekeeping of publishing houses who think that Filipino stories are very niche? Yeah, thanks a lot for this question. So actually I'm a market researcher by profession and um, I started writing only uh, relatively later in life. So yeah, I started actually with poetry. And when the first, yeah, first uh, few poems I wrote got published, so it gave me confidence to keep on writing. So I move on to um, short fiction. So a couple of my short fiction were published. That was in 2016 and um, 2018. Then I started actually writing um, long prose that grew out from my short story. And then when I had the full draft, so I asked the inputs of my friends. So they were like my beta readers, my friends and um, my, my niece actually, just to check for the <coughs> you know, generational thing. So when I was um, doing all that also concurrently, I attended a course by Curtis Brown Creative. Um, it's called Editing and Pitching Your Novel. So after I've taken that course, I've revised the first draft of my novel. And during that time, I also remember seeing an article from, uh, I think that's a Singapore, uh, Singapore Straits Times. So they announced the presence of a Penguin Random House. So I looked that article up and realized that they were actually open to submissions. So I didn't need to go through um, uh, I didn't need to go through an agent to be able to submit. So I sent to them directly. So I did that in June 2019, and when I did that, I actually expected to hear back probably um, six months or nine months later because that's how I think that's the the pace of the publishing industry. It's rather slow, but I know that's the standard. But um, fortunately, I heard back from them around August 2019. So from then, um, yeah, yeah, they required other stuff. So I worked on that before coming here to the US on November 2019. So between then and September 
2020, we did revisions, structural edits, copy edits. And finally, it was launched, um, published in Singapore in September 2020. So it was one of those books published during the pandemic. But fortunately, despite the pandemic, um, Penguin Random House was able to make it available. So it's available here in the US um, through Amazon, Barnes and Noble and Target. Um, I think that gives us an idea of what to expect when we go forward with book production, particularly with big, yeah. Uh, a big publishing house. Thank you, Mix. Don't go away. We still have more things to discuss. Um, yeah. Our next panelist is someone who made every Filipino proud with her news last year. In July 2020, Governor Ralph Northam appointed Luisa A. A. Gloria as the Poet Laureate of the Commonwealth of Virginia. Originally from Baguio, Luisa is the author of Maps for Migrants and Ghosts, which won the 2019 Crab Orchard Poetry Prize. The author of over 16 books and with over 30 years of experience teaching literature and creative writing, Luisa also leads workshops at the nonprofit News Writers Center in Norfolk. She is a university professor of English and creative writing in the MFA creative writing program at Old Dominion University, which she directed from 2009 to 2015. Please welcome Dr. Luisa A. Igloria. Thank you so much, Eileen. Uh, also, thank you to Deputy Chief of Mission, Bilia, for your um, thoughtful remarks. Consul Darrell and staff at the Philippine Embassy in DC, thank you for helping to organize this panel. I would like to read two short poems which I picked out from my most recent book, Maps for Migrants and Ghosts, to go with the Women's International Day theme for our panel. And uh, the first one came about partly from a memory of female relatives who would visit our home in Baguio in the summer. And once when I was 12 or 13, they came as usual. They gave me a once over and they said, tsk, tsk, with your bad teeth and skin, how are you ever going to become Miss Philippines? So this is a poem called, When I Think I Could Be Beautiful. Though I too live in a blur of worlds, I am one shade of brown, my blood not as obviously mixed. Who gave me this nose? I have no dimples. I have a brow broad as a page. The eyes tell when I am smiling and eyebrows constitute a language of their own. Never asleep, they are two republics separated by a bridge. Do you know the power of discarded fish bones? I know delight can interchange with dilate. I've strung the dried stumps of my daughter's birth cords on a safety pin. This is one way I keep them close. Do you know the sound the tin bucket makes, the shape of its mouth as it looks at the sky from inside the well? In the birdhouse made from hollowed out wood, wasps coming and going. They are not angry yet, only nesting. The ginger flower's torch burns with scent in the middle of the garden. Not even the rain can put it out. And the second poem I'm going to read is a sort of meditation <clears throat> on the apple and all of those stories of women that are typically associated with it. This is a poem called Orchard. It's fall, season of the apple, iconic fruit of this America, mounds of excess littering the grounds of orchards from want of migrant hands to pick the harvest clean. There read the banner of every girl or woman who tips her head up to the knowledge of her power, which means she can see the way things work in the world and chooses not to be shamed any longer for calling it. For what did the hissing in the leaves tell her that she didn't already know? Or the laughter 
character behind closed doors when she ran, groping her way out. Don't pretend you don't know what I want, said every snake in the grass. Survival means no one dies, but someone is forced to take the fall. The smallest bird, the lowest fruit, though the fruit isn't to blame for its sheen, nor the star for marking the place where its light was last seen. Thank you. Louisa, in Maps for Migrants and Ghosts, there is so much longing for a landscape that is no longer there. But then this work is also redemptive and transformative as the reader is summoned to have courage to, to make the journey. Um, certainly your work has influenced a new generation of American poets. Um, how does a Filipino American woman writer successfully achieve equilibrium in writing by blending distinct uh, experiences? And this question is from Carol Howard. Okay, thank you, Carol, for that that sounds like one of those really deep metaphysical questions that are hard to answer. But uh, I guess I want to start by saying first, I don't think it's possible to separate life from art and vice versa. So the idea of equilibrium or balance and the idea of um, successful blending is beguiling and very attractive. But this also seems to be premised on the thought that there's something, if not inherently wrong, then maybe disturbing about things that don't show symmetry perhaps, or that are different and stick out in some way. Uh, in writing classrooms, for example, it used to be that when a universal reader was invoked, in most cases that meant a straight, heterosexual, white male reader. But increasingly, I think there's more value in embracing and celebrating difference or unblendability, if you like, uh, we're able to create more powerful connections when we tell our very specific stories and histories, which are, of course, complex and messy, as well as profound and also ordinary. So perhaps rather than setting balance as the goal, I might lean more toward the idea of how to speak to or from uh, the multiplicity of our experiences. And sometimes they seem paradoxical or ambivalent, but they can live in the same space. Thank you, Louisa. If anyone has mastered the art of fusing art forms and experiences, um, it would be you. Um, we, have <laughs> we have more questions for you, but for now, please allow me to introduce our final panelist, Gail Romasanta. Gail's work has appeared on television, radio, online, and in journals and books such as the New York Times, Smithsonian Magazine, Harvard University's Education Next Journal, KQED's The Forum, ABS-CBN, and more. She co-authored the first book about labor leader Larry Itleon, Journey for Justice, with the late and great historian Dr. Don Mabalon. She was also the artistic director for Bindle Stiff Studio, the only Filipino-American theater space in the U.S. Currently, she is artist in residence at Brava Theater in San Francisco, writing and co-composing a new musical about Larry Itleon. Gail is the founder of Bridge and Delta Publishing, a publishing house committed to telling immigrant stories that are American at their core. Please welcome Gail Romasanta. Thank you, Eileen, and thank you so much, um, everyone, for having me here, Deputy Chief uh, Bia, also um, Consul Daryl. Um, I'm really honored to be here with these wonderful, beautiful women who have dedicated their lives to the act of writing and storytelling. Um, it's a beautiful thing, and it is a, it's a lifetime to do. Um, I'm going to read from Journey for Justice, The Life of Larry It Leon. Here's the book here. I'm going to read a couple of pages. Larry's heart ached with sadness and anger at so much injustice all around him. When it seemed that life could not get any worse for Larry and his friends, the U.S. Congress passed two laws, one right after the other aimed at Filipinos. One law barred almost all Filipino immigrants from entering the United States. The other law called the Repatriation Act offered Filipinos a one-way ticket 
home to the Philippines, but they could never return. Only about 2,000 Filipinos took the tickets. Feeling disappointed and defeated, they packed their bags, wore their best clothes, and boarded ships at the ports of San Francisco, Los Angeles, and Seattle. Meanwhile, Larry's friend, Carlos Bulasan, was writing a book about the Filipino experience in the United States. In the book, he wrote, in many ways, it was a crime to be a Filipino in California. Filipinos could not become citizens, nor could they vote, own land, or marry whites. They were being, being treated like animals in a land that they had once been taught was the greatest country on earth. Larry had a decision to make. Should he take the free ticket and go back to San Nicolas? He closed his eyes and imagined the waterfalls and the green mountains of his quiet village. He thought of his parents and his childhood sweetheart. Larry began to write a letter to his childhood friend. I'm sorry, but I'm not coming home, he wrote. His heart felt heavy as he explained that he had a new dream. He was staying in America. He wanted to be a label, labor organizer, someone who inspired his fellow workers to join together into a union that fights for their rights. Larry wasn't sure if he would ever become a lawyer, but he could still help people get justice. He was going to stay. So this is a really dense children's book. I'm gonna show you guys some of the pictures here. Um, I'm gonna read, Two more pages, or one more page. Um, and, and, and this is about the time for, for many of you or some of you who don't, do, uh, don't know Larry Itliong, many people do not know who Larry Itliong is. He actually um, co-founded the UFW, Filipino Americans and Mexican Americans co-founded the United Farm Workers together in an act of solidarity um, in 1966. But it was the Filipinos um, and, who actually started the Delano grape strike, which would eventually birth the United Farm Workers, um, which is a, a very well-known social justice movement here in the United States. Um, and I think this is a real testament to the fighting spirit of Filipinos, um, the fact that we will not um, back down. And, and uh, by the time we see them here in 1965 in the section that I'm gonna read, they, will have, they would have already been in the United States uh, protesting and asking for um, equal rights and equity and um, dignity in their workplace from the 1920s through 1965. So when the workers arrived in Delano, the grape growers refused to give them the same wage. On September 7th, 1965, Larry invited the hundreds of AWOC members and all the growers to meet at Filipino Hall in Delano to negotiate, but the growers didn't show up. Larry and AWOC union leaders such as Ben Gines, Pete Manuel, and Pete Velasco led the discussion in the crowded hall. They spoke in many different Filipino languages like Ilocano, Visayan, and Tagalog, and also in English so everyone could understand. Not all the AWOC members were Filipino. Some were African-American, Arab, Puerto Rican, Mexican, and some were white. But what about my wife and children? We might go hungry, a Filipino worker argued. One elderly Filipino stood up. We're not getting any younger, he shouted. This might be our last chance to win a good wage and the right to form a union. Many nodded their heads. Bob Armington, a leader in the community, raised his hand. I move that we vote to go on strike, he said. The crowd went silent. Larry called out, I want those in favor to stand up with your hands raised. Everyone stood up and raised their hand in the air. It was unanimous. They were going on strike. And so they go on strike and um, they protest for five years and they actually won. They were united for the first time Filipinos Americans were united um, in unity and in solidarity, um, fighting um, um, for a higher wage, um, getting um, medical, um, medical insurance and um, control of some of the pesticides um, that um, they were working with in the fields. And so that is my section that I'm reading. Gail, part of our Filipino American history has been foregrounded in the larger narrative of American history thanks to your book, Journey to Justice, um, The Life of Larry Leong. The lessons are momentous, including having inspired um, AB 123, which requires public school students in California to learn about the contributions of Philippine, Filipino Americans in the, in the labor movement. Is that right? 
Um, it actually, it, this was a perfect storm. Assembly Bill 123 that was actually written by our first Filipino American assembly member in the state of California. Um, he passed that and our governor at the time, Governor Brown signed it. Mm -hmm. um, so that, that states that if you are talking about the, the UFW, the United Farm Workers, if you're talking about the farm um, worker movement, social justice movement, you must include Filipinos and, and um, their contribution to the farm labor movement here um, in the United States, which is huge, right? I mean, that was, that's a law. And then um, October, October 25th was signed um, by Governor Brown and then signed um, with a proclamation just this last October, Larry Itliang Day, celebrating Larry Itliang's contributions um, to, to, to American history. So, uh, which, and that brings up this next question from a teacher who has trouble finding books with young Filipino characters. This is from Lisa Rizzo. Um, is that changing? What do you think is the future of multicultural children's books? I think, well, the numbers are still low, right? So there's only like, out of all the, all the children's books that are created in the United States, only 7% are people of color. And out of those 7% are Asians. Um, and then out of that, it's Filipino Americans. So we have a long way to go, but it's really, really encouraging out there. Um, just from the family library here that we have, we have Erin and Trada Kelly, we have Hello Universe. Um, if you guys haven't seen that, this is a well-regarded um, book. Um, also, one of the ones that I've had for a long time, La Casa in the Makibaka Hotel. Um, and this is um, by Tony Robles, um, a, a writer in the community um, that is just beautiful. And, and actually one of the, the first Filipino American children's books I actually um, saw. Um, uh, uh, many, many years ago that was actually that had the Filipino American aesthetic and a Filipino American um, story. Um, there's also Calipai and the Tiniest Tick Tick um, by Christina Newhart, who's also here in Oakland. Um, there's coloring books. This is by Panay, Color Her Story, Women of the World. Um, and we also have books that are coming in um, from Tahanan Press to Alphabet on uh, Filipino. And I love this book, Kakanin. Um, I think this is actually from, from the Philippines. Um, so there's actually so many books that we can get. Um, I know Amazon's like a big monster, but you can, you can get them through there. Um, there's also another one, um, Justine Villanueva. She's actually an attorney at Davis, um, but she has a wonderful book um, um, that is actually bilingual in Bukidnong and English uh, about um, a Filipino child who colors his books, um, his character's all brown because he wants to see himself in his children's books. So, I, and I don't have that book because the children love that book. My kids love that book and they had chewed it and wandered off with it. So I don't know where it went. Um, but so it, it's, it's very promising and the wonderful writers um, in our community, um, I, I love seeing what they're putting out and especially for the, for the next generation. So it is exciting um, work and it is, is growing little by little, but we are here and the technology is on our side to be able to do that as well. And I just wanna give a shout out to um, Eileen Tavios, um, who actually is um, also a writer who gave me a chance. She never, she never published children's book and Meritage Press, her press published my first children's book, um, Beautiful Eyes. Um, that was written over 20 years ago and nobody wanted to publish it and she published it and it actually um, now um, is in, in, in school districts and um, has, has its own life. So um, not only our writers, but our publishers in the community because publishers within our community have, have had to carry our work because no one else would in some instances. Um, so I think that it's, um, it's, it's a wonderful ecosystem they're all a part of um, that we all push for each other's work to come alive for our audiences. Thank you, Gail, for the shout outs. Um, we have so many incredible um, writers and shout out to Eileen Tabis as well, who launched the careers of many Filipino writers, including mine. Um, on that note, I'd like to move our discussion to our Filipino-ness and perhaps you can answer first, Gail. Please tell us a bit about your story growing up in the Philippines, immigrating to the US, and then finding yourself a writer in the diaspora. What was it like? 
you know, um, my father was a writer from uh, Manila Times and he worked in, in marketing as well. And a funny story, <laughs> we went to the Philippines and we went to S. Chanel Jose's uh, bookstore in the Philippines. And my dad, who is, I think he's gonna be 90 this year. He, he, he says to him, he said, hey, Frankie, what are you doing here? And I had no idea, lo and behold, that Frankie, F. Chanel Jose was his old editor at, uh, uh, in Manila Times. And so, you know, I didn't really know what my father wrote, but it kind of, um, it kind of uh, came uh, to me. I immigrated to the United States as a toddler and uh, my family, my mom's side of the family had been in the United States since the 1930s as farm workers, um, as veterans of World War II. They had fought um, for the United States here. Um, and it was all the men on my mom's side of the family actually ran away um, from the Philippines to here to California um, and eventually would set up and, and, um, and buy a farm out here. All eight of the men of my mom's family set up and, and bought a, a farm out here, so the whole family. And so I was really stuck in two different worlds. I, I mean, I was straddling really, Tagalog was the only language we, uh, you know, that we listened to in the home, but then you know, our other relatives never really didn't speak Tagalog. They did speak Ilocano, um, but, you know, they're very American in their ways and they're ecstatic and very much like Larry Itliong, they were like, go get them. We don't have time for anything. You better go do what we told you to do. So um, it was really much a very Filipino American upbringing that clashed with a, a very Filipino sensibility uh, that came from my parents. Um, so and, and I think coming out of that, I always knew I wanted to tell stories. Um, it's, uh, I think when you get stuck in those two cultures, it, it brings about um, a way to process, to, to also process that grief, the grief that you understood that was racism growing up for yourself and for your family and what had happened to your family members. Um, you know, in my family, we didn't know how um, the Manongs, our uncles and my Lolo bought the bought the farmhouse because at some point um, they were banned from owning property in the state of California. So we figured that when they had married their white wives or um, their Mexican wives, um, uh, you know, and they had to leave the state of California to get married, um, they had actually put the farm in um, the wives' names because they, Filipinos can own land. So, you know, the, all these traumatizing stories, I think I needed to process my grief and I needed to process you know, what it meant to be an American, um, a Filipino American. Um, and so I think the need to write came out of survival. Um, and eventually it just, you know, it, it took over as a love and, um, I, you know, it's just something that's never left me since I was very young. Yeah, truly heartbreaking and inspiring, Gail. It's not easy being an immigrant, more so to write about it. Uh, some of our most inspiring prose and poetry come from dark places, including um, our shared histories. Um, what about you, Louisa? Please tell us a bit about your journey and the ways in which Filipina writers revisit history. Sure. Um, I grew up in Baguio City in the Cordillera region. And originally, this place was home to indigenous communities that were pushed more to the margins or further into the mountains when this area was turned into an American um, hill station in the early 1900s. Um, Baguio has always had a profound influence on my growing up in formation and therefore also influences my writing in a huge way. Uh, much of Baguio's physical landscape still bears traces of this colonial encounter with America. In fact, there are lots of street names that are American names. And the fact that the blueprint of the colonial city was designed by Chicago architect Daniel Burnham. So I felt that even, even before I physically left um, Baguio in the Philippines to live and work in America, I, I already had a sense of the complex displacements that we associate with a diasporic condition. So even before I left Baguio, first to go to PhD school in Chicago, and then 20, 23 years ago when I accepted the job here at Old Dominion University, I, I feel like I was already writing about place and history and addressing the themes of loss and return. So I, I hope that, that answers the question. Yes, exactly. Um, so much of what we do 
um, as writers is uh, soul work. And a huge part of that uh, comes from generational scars. Um, is it the same for you, Mix? What was your journey as an immigrant and a writer like? Yeah, um, I guess in a way similar to Louisa, um, the influence of place is a big deal for me. Um, I grew up in Isabella, which is a valley. So the open spaces, the nature, all those things around me, somehow uh, they make a big presence in my poems, especially. So many of my poems are nature poems. Also, um, the small town setting. So uh, in, my, in my short fiction, as well as in the Rosales house, um, the setting of a small town uh, plays a great part in this story. So I guess as, um, as somewhat, someone from the Philippines writing in the diaspora, I find that somehow when I talk about nature, somehow it has a universal appeal. So it probably resonates to everyone regardless of place. Yeah, so that's what I, that's what I feel. What about you, Cecilia? Um, your work has consistently provided an insight into our history as Filipinos. What has your journey been like? Um, actually, it's an exciting journey. <laughs> I have to just say it out there. Um, there have been a lot of difficulties, uh, but you know, there have always been people. There have been people who've shown up and, and helped help. Uh, make the journey a little easier. Um, I was born and raised in Cebu, and I came to this country uh, to do graduate work in filmmaking at UCLA. And it's a long story, but I'll truncate it. Along the way, I gave up the filmmaking, and uh, as a wife and mother, um, I, I started dabbling in writing, and then I started writing. And as I was writing, I... Um, I had to work to find my, my Filipino voice because, you know, there was so much Hemingway and Faulkner in there that that was sort of like what was coming out. And when I was doing that, I had to look. I had to look at where I came from, Cebu. Of course, in my writing, it became Ubek. Not just Cebu, but the Philippines. And there were many little funny things, too, that would come along and I had to make adjustments in my head. Uh, just as an example, uh, the turn of the century Philippine American award insurgents were called insurgents. Uh, Ferdinand Magellan discovered the Philippines. <laughs> I had to think these things through. And the writing helped me do that. And so you, if one looks at my works, actually, they're looking at 1521, trying to see it from the Philippine point of view, not the Spaniards discovering us because we had been there forever. Um, and uh, World War II was another topic in my When the Rainbow Goddess Wept that I looked at. Uh, and then recently, The Newspaper Widow, my third novel, was looking at the period called the American period in 1909. And this was the era of my great grandmother. And so looking at those historical times, gives me a greater understanding and an appreciation of being Filipino and be, being Filipino American. There's another thing that's come up in the writing and apparently I write a lot about women and I don't consciously do that. Um, but uh, so there's another discrepancy here because Filipinas are supposed to be shy and passive and you know sweet and all of this. And yet I came from a family of strong women and so again, I had to like think that through. And I remember my mother, when I got married, she came to me one-on-one, -on -one, she goes, you know, die, tell your husband what he wants to hear, but you do what you want to do. <laughs> this was before women's lip days, you know? So, but at the same time, you see this like sweet, you know, kind of like, uh, you know, woman. So these things, have come out in the writing. Um, so I don't know if that answers the, the question, but there it is. Well, Cecilia, I have to add that your novel, um, The Newspaper Widow, um, is a master who done it. 
it uh, definitely gives a glimpse of Philippine history during the American period, particularly how much steel in their spine our foremothers truly possessed to birth a new um, era. Oh, um, thank you, Anne Marie. Thank you. For, before we move on, I just wanted to thank the audience for all the questions we received. If we don't have time to answer all of them, we'll make sure to send them to the authors after this event. This brings us to the concept of diaspora. Philippine history is already very complex and layered. And you add to that issues faced by generations of Filipinos born or raised in the diaspora. We're talking about layers of very intricate cultural and transgenerational narratives. So I'd like to ask all of you, how would you define home in diaspora? And how have you as writers in the diaspora influenced notions of race, gender, class, or ethnicity? And conversely, how have these uh, social issues shaped your own writing over the years? Luisa, maybe you can start us off. Okay, uh, I'm not sure how to answer the last part of the question though about how we have influenced um, these notions in others. Uh, that's also hard to answer. But anyway, some years ago, I had the opportunity to put together um, an anthology called Not Home But Here, which was published by Anvil in Manila. These were essays by Filipino writers in different parts of the world reflecting on this very same question, how living away from the Philippines influences their creative process, among other things. And um, many ideas that we share in common about the question have to do with the, uh, I guess, the simultaneous experience of a certain kind of freedom to reinvent oneself in one's circumstances to reinvent notions of family and community alongside the experience of nostalgia defined as the inability to return to a time or a place or a condition that one occupied before perhaps. So the, con the conclusion that many of us arrived at is mostly that there are multiple ways to define home as many as there are multiple ways to define uh, being Filipino or Filipinex in the world. But at the same time, we can't escape the histories of our formation. And also, um, I, I kind of think that living in the diaspora is not the same thing as that uh, saying we sometimes hear when people say, oh, I'm a citizen of the world. Uh, because the latter, I think, implies the kind of mobility and access and privilege that not everyone can claim simply by virtue uh, of the fact for some reason they now live outside of the Philippines. And I think for instance of the situation of um, our overseas foreign workers or migrant Filipino workers is not the same. Uh, but I also like to think that poetry is one of those homes or art is one of those homes that we can make. Uh, and it is there that we can maybe help to negotiate some of those returns that are that feel impossible in any other way. Thank you, Luisa. That certainly pushes us to meditate on issues of class and race. Um, what about you, Cecilia? How did you create your home and community in the diaspora? And how has this influenced your writing? Um, so I have many homes. I have a home in Cebu. I have a home in Manila. And I have a home in California. And sometimes I feel I don't really belong, you know, in the one place, because I'm a little bit different in each place. So I'm, I'm kind of a misfit. But that's also okay, because I've discovered that as a mis misfit, I can actually have a kind of an objective eye. And I can look at Cebuanos, and I can, you know, say this, and I can look at Americans, and I can say this, because I've got this um, uh, perspective that's broad. Um, I probably addressed some of the issues about the diaspora and the writing earlier. Um, so again, it's basically the history and uh, the business of women that have uh, come out in the writing. And um, there's one thing though that I want to mention because I think it's very important, especially for the young people if they're watching. One of the things that really shaped me as a writer and perhaps as a person was knowing about our Philippine epics. And at some point I was, I belonged to a folklore uh, epic group over at UCLA Filipinos. And it was an eye opener to me because never in my schooling at St. Teresa's College or Marino did I know 
was I informed that we have ancient Philippine epics and that we had, and I don't know if we still have, epic singers who sang them. And when I learned that, it was most empowering. I mean, these are, you know, because I used to look up Homer and, you know, the Odyssey and all, but we had our own epic songs. And it was, it really um, meant an awful lot to me. And one of the images, for instance, that really stayed in my mind was the goddess, our own goddess, Mei Buyan, who took care of the, the dead babies. Um, so in our epic songs, there is the river, the river of the dead. And when people die, they go there. And Mei Buyan was a goddess who took care of the dead babies. And so she had breasts, she had multiple breasts all over her body. She would feed them. And it was, it was, it was touching. I understood there were many babies who died and that in our stories, we created this goddess to take care of them. In any case, um, the Philippine epics, uh, and I, I actually retold some of them and I integrated them into my first novel, When the Rainbow Goddess Wept. Because I think in the last analysis, probably we writers um, are also kind of writing our, our own mini epic songs. Um, so so that, that's sort of it. I, so it's the history and the business of women that have affected me a lot and that have been coming out through the writing. What a moving example of how we continue to create a sense of home wherever we may be. Um, speaking of class and race, I was one of the 17 million people who watched uh, Meghan Markle's interview last night where issues of race and skin color came up. As Filipinos, we're all aware of colorist uh, attitudes, specifically from the perspective of class. Any thoughts about this, Gail? How have issues of race and class influenced your work and vice versa? Oh, wow. I think I bring that lens to everything I write just because growing up, I had parents who very much understood uh, a class society um, who had very strict rules about not blending in with certain um, social structures and people. Um, but when I you know, was growing up as a total Filipino American, I thought I was Mexican. Um, <laughs> you know, I grew up within um, hip hop culture. I uh, grew up into a very Americanized um, world that my parents didn't want me to go in. Um, they very much were part, you know, saying that I had to be a Maria Clara. That was the only way for me. There was, <laughs> you, you did this and you did that. Um, that's the only way. And so I think um, just trying to understand that and also understanding the tribal, tribal ways of different, uh, uh, growing up with an a Tagalog father and an Ilocano mother and being surrounded by Ilocanos for most of my upbringing and then as an adult being surrounded by Tagalogs. I mean, you can really begin to see all the so many different cultures um, that we bring to the table and we, you know, we're not all the same. Um, I think one of the things that Larry Itliang said in, um, in a recording that I listened, he said that the downfall of the Filipino is going to be, it, the downfall of the Filipino is the tribalism. Um, and because we, we want to protect, you know, the Ilocanos or the Tagalogs or, or this and that. And so the only way that we can actually unify in the, in the United States is to actually, um, is to come together and not necessarily forget who we are, um, but to really fight together. And I think that's where, as I became politicized because my parents were also very political on top of everything else, um, I had to really come to my own terms uh, what that meant. That meant letting go of classism. That meant letting go um, and really understanding a privilege of, of what light skin um, and, and where I've been able to go because I know I've been light skin where else, you know, my other family members who were out in the sun working really hard and had um, darker skin or, um, you know, couldn't go. And, and I knew that that was my privilege. Um, and the way, uh, and so I knew that, and I had to come to terms, to come to terms with that, and to also come to terms that in the United States, we are united because of the violent racism against us. The, the class, the class 
issues and and and, and those 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 walls and, and the tribalism and, and and us standing you know behind um, our own dialects have fallen away here, especially as I've been growing up. Um, and people don't necessarily even associate with that anymore, but we're all kind of in the same boat, I guess we can say here in the United States, um, just because there's anti-Asian uh, um, American sentiment right now. Um, you know, my parents actually um, were injured and hurt um, prior to um, COVID. Um, and so, uh, you know, my, my mom was hurt out on the street. And so, you know, there is no hiding. There is no way you could be in any class. You can have any kind of education here and it doesn't matter. They will see you where they see you. Um, in one point in my life, I was an intern for Capitol Hill um, and I was an intern for the Congressman for my college, um, the, the former president of my college who became a Congressman. And I was an intern there and I really thought I was protected. Um, but that's not true. <laughs> um, you know, I thought I was doing everything right. I was a model minority. In fact, I was working for a Republican, um, you know, um, but that's not true. And, and I slowly began to learn that um, we are in the same boat, that the same violence, the same racism. Um, you know, when I was there, people would tell me don't steal anything when they'd leave the office. Um, even though I was there on a fellowship and, you know, that didn't even occur to me. I just really wanted to work. and and. and do well, but people will see you the way that they want to see you because of the violent racism here, um, and and the prevalent racism um, that we you know just like in the Meghan Markle <laughs> interview that's making the rounds stay in the media. Um, it is hard to let go of that colonialism. It is hard to let go, and um, and I think that is one way that we can come together regardless of class, um, you know, uh, color. Um, and race here in the United States. Gail, I'm so sorry about what happened to your parents, um, but I have to say that your work has consistently created necessary and safe spaces for our community. Um, Thank you, Irene. Um, how about you, Migs? Um, having spent the last several years in Singapore, I imagine it would have been a very different uh, diasporic circumstance for you. How did that affect your writing? Yeah, so similar to um, Cecilia in a way, whenever I hear the question of home, I, I translate to where is home. So <laughs> earlier, of course, I think of home as the Philippines, which still is in many ways. And then we moved to Singapore and we lived in Singapore for 15 years, close to 15 years before coming here. So Singapore is also home for me. Finally, we came here and um, we were just, as I was saying to you earlier, we were just actually settling in before the pandemic came. So this uh, process <laughs> of settling in um, has been stalled. So in a way, I'm still, it's a, like a very important question at this point because for me, um, being at home means, you know, you have that sense of belonging. And because of all that happened in 2020, so I still don't get that sense. But having said that, as a person in the diaspora, I guess um, this, is, um, this comes through in my writing because I also feel what it is to be longing. Longing, for example, to be with your loved ones, your relatives, like um, missing their milestones, especially during COVID, right? So, um, I also used to go back to the Philippines at least twice a year, and especially during my mom's birthday and also at Christmas. So for the first time, of course, I miss my mom, mom's birthday, uh, which, is, which was a milestone kind of birthday. So yeah, but um, it's like a, all, a question that we always encounter. So I think it's, it's I guess it's uh, how, how we try to settle in wherever we are. And hopefully, yeah, it becomes easier <laughs> along the way. Now, uh, in terms of the question of race and uh, gender, class, or ethnicity, um, I don't have much experience. I mean, I'm, I've just come in here, so I don't have much experience or knowledge about the race issue. But what I can talk about is, uh, 
on women. So I write specifically for women and um, I write about women, but uh, I think it doesn't, my writing doesn't alienate male readers. And that's something I'm actually quite happy about because even if I write, I know my target. And I guess I'll always write for women, but whenever, you know, my friends read it, then I mean, uh, they have like positive feedback. So in a way, I'm glad that it doesn't alienate uh, male readers. Yeah. That, that actually leads to my next question. Um, what's your writing process like? Yeah, so um, since coming, I used to work uh, in Singapore as a market researcher, but since coming to the US, um, I've been writing full time. So I try to be consistent in my writing. So I, I think that's one of the things I try to establish is to write daily. So even if it's just a haiku, <laughs> so sometimes I just like, you know, try to write haiku just to keep on the keep the discipline or sometimes even just a short paragraph of uh, what happened during the day but whenever i know that uh, for example tomorrow i'm going to write for a couple of hours um i prepare a playlist and so on the day that <laughs> i i write longer i i play that um on and on repeatedly until i get bored so <laughs> Yeah, so I have that kind of playlist that uh, can go on probably for two weeks <laughs> in a row, sing, sing songs. And also I get inspired by nature. So whenever I go for a walk, I try to be present. Um, I try to observe, you know, what's happening around me, tiny things, tiny flowers, what's the color of the bird, <laughs> um, what kind of trees this, you know, how, basically I try to be present and observe those details because for me as a writer, it, it's important to, you know, write um, with depth and we can go to that only if we, uh, we observe the details. It's, it's really interesting to hear about the rituals that writers have when it comes to craft. Um, how about you, Louisa? How do you stay creative each day? Well, I resonate a lot with what Migs just said about needing to write every day because maybe some of you know, I have been keeping up a daily writing practice for the last 10 years and running four months now where I try to write at least one poem a day. And I just came to this, I guess, out of the same need as all artists do to find that time to cultivate what feeds them most deeply. And we can't all go away to a residency for two months. That is such a privilege. That's such a luxury. But we do have, well, I've found um, at least a half hour to 45 minutes of the day, no matter how small, is something that I can take. And so I've just kind of learned to use that, to work with what I have. And um, I don't set any expectations. I don't have a set time of day to write. I don't really set a subject. So whatever is, you know, uh, whatever my being is, is feeling most deeply at that moment or whatever has crossed my path, uh, be it in, in a form of um, literature I've read or something that was interesting on the news or even art, you know, everything is, is um, fuel for the creative process. So hopefully I can keep this up, um, but I've managed to get at least four uh, complete published books out of my daily writing practice and at least three chat books. What a feat. That is so hard to do, writing one poem a day for the last 10 years. Um, congratulations, Louisa. Uh, Gail, you are not only a writer and publisher, you're, you're also into winemaking. And I like that you and your husband make wine that pairs well with Filipino food. What inspired you to do this? You know, it was my husband. Growing up, we were surrounded by grapes here and I went to a high school named after a grape. So I didn't really think much of it. And I brought him here to the Central Valley in California in Stockton and Lodi. And he's from San Francisco and he, did, he never tasted a real grape, I mean, a real grape from a <laughs> vine before or a tomato for that matter. So um, he decided he was gonna learn how to, um, to work the land. And so he did. And I have to say, I don't know any other Filipinos uh, men 
um, who have done that recently. Um, and so he, he really wanted to learn. So we did learn, um, we lived out in the country, um, actually lived on a vineyard so, uh, so he could learn um, you know, the seasons. Um, and, and it really was because we're theater people and we're artists and I was a writer and I've always written anywhere I go. So it's actually, I'm able to, to do this artistically. And he, you know, we take turns in, in doing our artistic life. Um, I know I'm able to do my artist life because he helps me so much. Um, a real, real heavy lifter with childcare. I have four kids. Um, and, um, you know, so we take turns and, and that was his turn. That was his turn to be artistic. And so, um, you know, in elevating women's voices and, 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 and the fact that, that we are able to, to write in this way and to continue on because I've seen so many women artists who are not able to because it is a lot of stress to continue as a writer, um, to continue as an artist, um, you know, um, going through the different phases of a woman. Um, and so I've held on fast to it just because there's no way, I, there's nothing else I, I can do at this point. <laughs> I'm not gonna, yeah, I don't know how to code. I don't know, how to, I only know how to write. Um, so, you know, that that was the give and take. Um, I actually, um, you know, I, I like drinking it with just tasting it and, and, and knowing it. And I think it's, it's almost like writing. If you write every day, like Louisa does, um, and you can look back on your writing, it's the same thing as wine. Wine is actually really a snapshot of the growing conditions of that year. So if it was a dry year or if it wasn't hot enough, or it was really hot, then you get really, really sweet grapes. Um, you know, or if it rains, then, then everything's finished. You can't, and right when you're about to pick, that's no good. Um, and it's almost like writing so that you can actually take a look back at the growing conditions of yourself as a writer, as a person throughout the year. If you do that every day, same thing with wine. It is a snapshot. Um, and you're actually drinking um, what was going on with the land um, and, and the growth um, and those very specific vines that you're drinking. So when you drink the wine, you, you can, everyone can remember that now, it's a snapshot. Well, Gail, your writing certainly reflects the powerful connection between land and food and society. Um, Cecilia, you've been drawing and painting a lot lately. How do we practices inspire you to craft stories? Um, <laughs> actually, I've been using the art in covers, book covers. And I also have a, a book of sketches. And um, I, um, so we redid um, uh, uh, Magdalena, my second novel, and integrated some of my sketches in there. So Magdalena's US edition now has um, about 22 of my sketches in there. So that's been fun to do. Um, what's my writing process like? I am, I, I am so undisciplined and so I need deadlines. I, I wish I were like you, Louisa, I could just, and, and Migs write every day. Uh, I, I, there's so many things that get in my way. I have family, I have gardening, I have whatever, whatever. So before the pandemic, and even though I was teaching creative writing, um, I would put myself into a master workshop, writing workshop. Because if somebody told me to bring in 10 pages next week, I will do it. But if I'm on my own, oh, there's so many other things to do. So it's been a little tough with the pandemic, although I'm in an art class, and so I'm producing the art because I've got a teacher who's, you know, giving us work. Um, so the, um, the writing has been kind of sporadic. However, I've been doing a lot. I had to work on getting selected short stories together and sent that to the publisher. And so, but it's mostly editing and sprucing up the work. There is um, a, a, something in my head that wants to come out and it's not fiction, it's more creative nonfiction. And so I, I made little stabs at it and I probably need a deadline, but it's, it, it, so it's like that. It's sort of 
gets in your brain and then it becomes kind of like an obsession until finally you gotta let it come out you know so so that's that's my magical experience of the the creative process Cecilia, there's actually a question for you from Betty Ann Carino. Yes. Have, have you transformed your fiction to audiobooks? What are your thoughts on audiobooks in today's publishing market? Oh, I've never thought of that, but I will talk to Betty Ann about that. Um, that would be kind of fun, I think. No, I haven't looked at that. I've been, um, I'm so preoccupied with the word on print. Um, and so one of the things I was doing during the pandemic too was I had some books that were in the Philippines that were out of print. And so, so now there are US editions of that. Um, but audio, so that's, that's a really good idea. Um, and I will look into that. Thank you, Betty Ann. <laughs> uh, Cecilia, follow up. Would you have any advice for future writers? Future writers, I actually have quite, a, quite a, a bunch I wrote down. Number one, it is really important to read. Even though you want to write, you read. And what do you read? You read the kind of work that you would like to produce. If you want to be a novelist, read fine novels. If you want to be a poet, read fine poetry. So that's what you do, number one. Number two, take a good writing workshop. Um, you need to learn the fundamentals. You just need to learn it. You know, sometimes people think, oh, I'm writing my third novel and I don't need to learn how to write dialogue or whatever. Um, and I've seen them in my classrooms too. And, and they, do need, they do need help most of the time. So taking a workshop is good. Number three, keep a journal. So Migs is right there about journal writing. Um, it, it keeps, keeps, things flowing. It's a lot of, it's exercise, it's practice, it's non-judgmental. It allows you to flow and you really want to flow. Um, so I think that was it. And then there was a question too about resources. And I just wanted to mention when the pandemic started, I decided to uh, make free my fundamentals of creative writing in Wattpad, Wattpad to help teachers. Um, so if there are people who want to learn the fundamentals of creative writing, as in plot, setting, dialogue, characters, and so on and so forth. Um, if you go look for Cecilia Brainerd in Wattpad, it's free. Um, so a lot of teachers have been using that, and that's that's my contribution during this pandemic. Thank you, Cecilia. Um, what about you, Gail? How does a young writer find their voice? You know, I have to um say yes to what cecilia said you have to read um I, I i've spoken to different places where people ask me like how do i do this or how do i write how do i keep on going you have to read you have to read as much as you write if you're going to write for one day you have to read for at least like a few hours to to even get inspired and to get in the mood there's a book that i've been reading um for over 20 years now that just puts me into the, the five senses, right? You, you have to have that book and you also have to have certain books that are your North stars that, um, that you kind of know if you read those book or you have them and they're always continually with you that, that, that you know that the project that you're working on because goodness knows us writers have many different projects and, and writing a whole bunch of different things. But if, if we have our North stars with us um, and I have my North stars on my bed. Um, you know, I would, I would say, uh, make sure you have that you read, you have your North star books, um, that help align you with what you, what you want to do. And then also, you know, I grew up in the time of, um, of Doc Martens, of anti-establishment, of Generation X, of zines, of people making their own zines, um, of, um, a really like a punk rock aesthetic um, and kind of like a headbanger kind of um, thing happening. And then um, rap and hip hop were just coming out too. So it was really kind of an inventiveness. And, and, I, and I implore all, implore all writer, writers and artists to, to bring back the kind of invest, inventiveness um, that the, the establishment or, or folks who are in control, those are the gatekeepers who say, you know, the Filipino story is not there. Um, 
not yet there yet. And, and, and it still is, right? Because I, I write grants. Like I actually did not sleep yet. Want you guys all to know because I stayed up late writing a grant um, after everyone went to sleep. I, I wrote it and I submitted it. Um, but I, I still have to write grants. And so many times I've heard there is no audience. Even since I was, a, you know, a, a, a young artist to now, there is no audience for your work. You know, I've heard Filipinos don't read. They're not, they're not going to buy. Um, and, and, and it's really kind of, you know, yeah, it is BS. I, I don't, excuse me, excuse my language. That is not true. Um, but, um, but I do think that you have that, that genius. Like our community has that genius. We have shown time and time and again, historically, that we can overcome. You just do a little bit of that puck rock, punk rock attitude, um, that head, head banger spirit, and you make it yourself. You do it yourself and you do not wait until someone gives you permission to tell your story. If that means an open mic, um, then that, that it means an open mic, you know, to read your poetry or to read your stories. For me, it was years and years reading stories or, 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 or doing poetry or submitting or actually being on the staff of, of magazines and literary journals, even starting a literary journal um, at California College of the Arts. And so, um, you know, it means doing all that um, because even in the, even in the mainstream, you'll be surprised that no one, no one um, has those kinds of avenues. Um, you know, for instance, at CCA, there was no literary arts journal there, even though there was like, this is California College of the Arts in San Francisco and um, Oakland, which they're closing the Oakland campus, but it, it's huge, hugely funded, one of the largest art schools on the, on the West Coast, but they didn't have a literary arts journal that, that put together arts and, and um, the visual arts graphic arts and design and, and, and writing. Like they did not see writing as an art form yet. And it's like, well, I'm not gonna wait. We can't wait for it. So um, I created it with um, an artist named Yumna Shlala. And, um, you know, uh, so you just kind of have to, to, to have that spirit. And if it's not there, as people of color, as Filipinos, you have to make it yourself, unfortunately because no one really is trying to give us anything, <laughs> unfortunately. <laughs> Absolutely. Um, Migs, anything to add? Migs, uh, Migs, can you unmute? Okay, sorry about that. <laughs> yeah, so similar to what um, Cecilia has mentioned it's important to read. So I also try to read a lot of both fiction and nonfiction, as well as a lot of craft books. So um, one, one book that I actually strongly recommend is the Norton's Guide to Creative Writing by Alice LePant. So I, I found that um, because one of the courses that I wanted to enroll in but couldn't um, show this, uh, showed it as a textbook. So I bought it and then, yeah, just uh, read the entire thing and it's very helpful. So it, it talks about the basics of plot, character and so on, yeah. Louisa, um, what resources or uh, advice would you recommend to help young writers? Yeah, I would echo everything that everybody has said already, but in addition, perhaps I would say, not don't just read as much and as widely as you can. Uh, read even outside of your discipline. Read outside of your genre. In fact, I often tell my students when you, when you don't like something that you've encountered, I think there is something there that might teach you something about yourself. So explore that. Even if you eventually walk away from it, at least you would have tried to figure out what it was that you were having such a visceral reaction to. And I think that teaches us about ourselves as writers. And I would say also uh, pay attention to the world. Um, don't be afraid to feel and think deeply. Because I think a lot of what we do as writers and artists has to do with, um, I guess, ideas of taking risks or being able to um, trust and trust our work to a larger public other than whatever we hear, the, voice, the voices that we hear in our heads. So um, also I wanna say something because Gail, you said something about, I guess, to me, it's about community. 
Uh, and I think that for all the lip service that we sometimes pay to community, I think there should also be a culture of reciprocity to make that energy come around. Because it's easy to talk about this, but what about we do something about it, as you were saying, review each other's works, build each other up instead of, I don't know, you know, the opposite of that, right? Thank you. And with that, on behalf of the Philippine Embassy, thank you all for joining us. Um, special thanks to Deputy Chief of Mission Renato Villa, to Consul Daryl Artates and the Embassy's Cultural and Public Diplomacy sections for organizing this event. Um, thank you to all who sent in their questions. Thank you most of all to our brilliant and gracious uh, panelists, Cecilia Mangera Brainard, Migs Bravo Dutt, Dr. Luisa A. Gloria, and Gail Roma Santa. You can find out more about them and how to purchase their books on their website, which um, the embassy posted uh, in the chat portion. Maraming salamat at mabuhay. Happy International Women's Day, everyone. More power to Filipino women and Filipino writers everywhere. Stay safe, everyone.